how nice that car was when it hit empty. It was dysfunctional. That was a dysfunctional vehicle. Some of you bikers know it doesn't. You can have a an expensive Harley Davidson, amazing bike, and I don't care how many thousands upon thousands of dollars you pay for. I don't care how brand new it is. If the tank is empty, now look, I know nothing about engines. I don't know anything about like that kind of stuff. But I know this: if the tank is empty, what? You ain't going. You ain't going anywhere. Honey. A lawnmower is faster than your Harley, right? A lawnmower is faster than your Harley. Isn't that so? Right. The problem is anytime you fail to recognize the function of a design, you overlook the value of a design. Humanity has been sold that we're worthless, that we're, the enemy wants you to believe that you're a failure because your tank has been empty, because you've been on the side of the road dysfunctional. The enemy wants you to believe, therefore, you are worthless. Therefore, you have no value because you don't have the strength to move because a lawnmower is faster than you. The enemy wants you to believe, therefore, you're no good. You're just worth tossing away. But when we come back to the manufacturer's design and we realize you were made in the likeness of God, in the image of God. When we come back to the manufacturer's standard, for your design you realize there's something that's meant to fuel you and maybe we don't know exactly what that is maybe we have a very very expensive harley on our hands but we've never put the right fuel in the tank so we really don't know how well this design functions pam one time we, we were getting our car work done and so they gave us a loaner because they were trying to upsell us. You know, they, they wanted us to, to, to buy more. And so they gave us a loaner that day. And it was this unbelievably expensive, really nice car. And I had all these meetings, that staff meetings that day. So Pam, she suddenly came up with all kinds of things that she needed to run errands on. She wanted to take the new car out around town and drive around. And so she's like, can I have the keys? And I'm like, yeah, sure. So she took the keys. And so I go into a staff meeting, an hour and a half later, I come out, and there she is in the staff hallway, and she's kind of tapping her toe, and I can tell she's upset. She's not happy because she's still there, and I'm thinking, why is she not out cruising the town in this brand new expensive car? Well, she says, that, she goes, that car, that, that car is stupid. That car is, she goes, it's no good for nothing. And I'm thinking to myself, it's a brand new car. Like, I mean, it's an expensive car. What do you mean it's a stupid car? See, we tend to, when something is dysfunctional, we can't make it work. Have you ever noticed that? We tend to think it's stupid. We tend to almost become critical of it. Well, it's like, ugh, right? And so I go out to the car and I'm like, I'm thinking in my mind, I got a feeling I know what's wrong. She goes, I can't start it. There's, there's a button in there in the car and she keeps pushing the button and it won't start. And so I thought, well, you know, because I just told you, like, I'm no good at cars or no good at engines. I thought this is a chance to kind of look like a hero. So I, I, you know, I've rented enough cars. I knew what the problem was. So I sat in there. You're right. You got it. I sat in. I gently put my foot on the brake and pressed the button. And all of a sudden, all those horses woke up and the thing was rumbling. And, and I looked like the hero. She goes, how did you do that? But you see, if Pammy don't know, Pammy don't go. Right? And some of you, some of you, you have been getting critical with your design. And you're like, what's, like, I'm, I bet you I've heard you. What's wrong with me? Why do I keep falling in that same place? What is my problem? You probably looked in the mirror and criticized your design and said, what in the world? Why can't I do why can't I be right? Why can't I do right? But until you know that amazing design of yours won't go. You need to know. You've got to know. And the enemy's trying to seduce us into thinking, you, you know what? It's okay. It's all look, you know, it's just all grace. The grace of the Lord is just, it's all good. But you know what? It's not all good. 
It's time for you to know. I told you the other day, I said, if you could know something a little bit more for your design, something from God, something from the word of God to make you go better, to make your life work better, wouldn't you want to know it? Absolutely. Ignorance is not bliss. You know, we're not going to sit around. We're not going to sit back and just say, you know what? I'm okay with not knowing. You know what? We're not going to do that anymore. We're going to say, you know what? I want to know, God. I want to know what the word of God says. So let's take a look at that. Joy is critical to your design. I want to make a case for this, that joy is the fill to your tank. See, we, as Christians, we talk a lot about love. Well, you know, the love of God, right? It's all about the love of God. And it is. 1 Corinthians 13, 13 says that the love of God is, it's the greatest. It says faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Okay, so love is great. But, you know, think about it. You know, a Formula One race car, talking about engines, you know, those cars cost anywhere between $12 million and $20 million. That's a lot of money for a vehicle, Right? 12 million to 20 million dollars for a vehicle. But you know what's funny about those vehicles? If they don't have any fuel in the tank. See, me and you, we don't even have to be car experts and we know that. There you got like 12 to 15 million just sitting on the side of the racetrack and it ain't going anywhere. And everybody's like, what's the problem with that car? It does, you know, like seriously, if you just put like five dollars of gas in the tank, suddenly 12 million dollars is humming. But you've got to have something in the tank. And here we are. We are more intricately designed by God Almighty. God said, let us make mankind in. He was talking about the species of man made in the image of God. And yet we know a Formula One race car needs fuel in the tank. But yet we don't even know where our tank is. We don't even know what goes in it. And we're sitting around once again talking about the love of God. Well, isn't the love of God? It's wonderful. The love of God, we're designed to live in the love of God. It's amazing. But if you don't know what's going in your tank, then you're trying to put all kinds of Kool-Aid in it, orange juice, and you're wondering why you're not working still. Like, I mean, that Formula One race car, we can put all kinds of apple juice in the tank and say, the tank is full. But you and I know it's not going to go anywhere, is it? Because you need to have the right fill for the right vehicle, for the right tank. So let's look, what is the fill for you and me? It says here in Nehemiah 8, verse 10, it says this. Don't sorrow. Don't feel empty. Don't be upset. It says, do not sorrow. It says, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord is your fuel. Notice what it didn't say. It didn't say that the love of the Lord is your fuel. We got a lot of parents. Think about this, parents. We got a lot of parents. We got a lot of grandparents who deeply, deeply love their kids. They, I know parents that they would lay down their, their, their life in a heartbeat for their kids, for their grandkids. We got parents who deeply love their kids and at the same time, feel completely helpless to do what they need to do for their kids. They're, they're just, they're worn out. They're exhausted. They, they, they want to help them with their homework. They want to help them with this. They want to, you know, like with, you got adult kids. They want to step in and they want to do this. They want to help them out. And they love them. Oh my goodness. They would lay down their life for their kids. And yet, they're stuck. Why? No strength. And they keep thinking and they, parents, come on, have you ever done this? You're thinking, I adore my kids. I love my kids. What's my problem? You see, then we start criticizing our functionality. What's my problem? Why can't I do more? Why can't I sacrifice more for my kids? Because you can only give what you've got to give. And there's no joy in the tank. Like I said, there's that Formula One race car and a lawnmower is faster. And then you begin beating up on yourself and you're like, well, maybe I'm not such a good parent after all. You know, I love my kids, but maybe I'm just a lousy mom. Maybe I'm just a no good dad, but you don't realize you got nothing in the tank. 
This is the same thing with married couples. You know, I've sat in my office with married couples getting ready to get a divorce. They're getting separated. They're getting ready to get a divorce. And they look at each other with tears running down their face and they love each other. But yet they're going to get divorced because you know why? There's nothing in the tank. And they think, well, maybe we just, maybe we've run our course. I, I just can't do this. I don't have the strength to go on anymore. I just don't have the strength. And they keep looking at love to somehow make up the gap when the Bible never said that the love of the Lord is your strength. It never said that. But we assume it because we really don't know, so we really can't go. The joy of the Lord is your strength. That's what Nehemiah 8 verse 10 says. John 15, 11. Let's hear what Jesus said. Like, I mean, if that's the truth, let's hear what Jesus said. John 15, verse 11 says this. Jesus talking and he says, I've told you these things. So if Jesus is telling us things, what's he telling us? He's telling us the word of God. He's telling us the will of God. He's telling us the promises of God. So Jesus says, I've told you these things. So what? So what? What, what reason? He says that my joy and delight may be in you. Oh, King Jesus himself is telling us. Did you know that the Bible says that Jesus went? Look, come on. We all know we're going to celebrate Easter soon. Jesus went to the cross for us. What an amazing feat. Like, what, what an amazing feat to do something. Like, how do you carry the weight of the sin of the world on your shoulders? All of the sickness to the cross. How do you do such an amazing thing? Where do you source the strength? The word of God says, for the joy set before him endured the cross for the, Did it say love? We know God loved the world. God so loved he gave. We know the why is love, but the how is what? J-O-Y. J -O -Y. So there's a lot of you. You got the right reason. But you don't have the how. You don't have the fuel in the engine. You, you, you've got the Formula One race car. You got nothing in the tank. And so there you are, you're up pushing a $12 million vehicle down the road. And everybody's like, what in the world's wrong with him? I thought Jim was a Christian. I, I thought he supposedly had Jesus. I thought, you know, that was supposed to be the answer. Jesus is the answer, but God gives us the full portfolio of everything we need. He gives us the design, but he gives us the fuel for the tank. And if you don't know, there you are with an amazing design, but nothing in the tank. Say, Stephen, I'm getting it. You can't help others when you have no strength. You may want to. You may have the motive to help them. But Jesus, for the joy set before him, endured the cross. Imagine if he just loved us, but had no joy to motivate him to do the heavy lifting. Yes, love is the great command, the great why, but joy is the strength to walk it out. Psalm 16, verse 11. Listen to this. Because if, you, if you're going to get joy, you need to know where to get it, right? Psalm 16, verse 11 says this. In the presence of the Lord, there is joy. See, now this morning, we've been worshiping God. We've got such a great worship team. Everybody's been lifting their voices, singing praises. We've been worshiping God, but if you don't know what to get, like, you know, when you go to a filling station, you get fuel. You, you know where, to, if you want a McDonald's hamburger, where do you go to get it? McDonald's. If you want an American Eagle pair of jeans, you go to American Eagle. If you need fuel in your tank, you don't go to the bank for it. You go to a filling station, right? You need to go to a gas station to get the fuel. It says, in the presence of the Lord, there is So where do you get the joy in the presence of the Lord? But if you don't know what you're doing in the presence of the Lord, I, I've heard of even worship leaders. I've done worship leader conferences, and I've heard worship leaders get up and say, you know what? We just worship the Lord because of who he is. That's good enough. We don't expect anything. We just worship the Lord for who he is. Forgive me, but that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. Why would you pull into the filling station 
and just sit there and look at the gas pumps and go, you know, I just believe that this filling, this filling station is a filling station and I'm just here to acknowledge that. It's wonderful. All right, let's move on, kids. You're there for a reason. You're there to get something. You don't honor God when you show up into his presence and you walk away empty handed. He's the creator of everything. You honor God when you believe God, when you trust God. And when God's given, like parents, come on. Parents, when you make a good meal, when you lay it out for your kids, do they honor you when they go, oh, Mom, now I know you made a good meal, but I just want to acknowledge your goodness. And I'm here just to say, I don't expect anything. So I'm just going to push away. You, they don't honor you. Mom, when you make an amazing meal, Dad, when you... When you make an amazing meal, your kids honor you when they sit down and they say, thanks, mom. Thanks, dad. This is all. when they consume it. They honor you, don't they? Yeah. Right. Yeah. How much more when God has provided everything. God's done all the heavy lifting and we show up in the presence of, the, of God and we're like, no, no, I just want to acknowledge that you're God, but I don't expect anything. No, push it. You know, your design needs the joy. And God's like, here's the joy. Like, take the joy. Receive the joy. Right. right? Jesus said, I've spoke these things to you so that my joy might be in you. He said, I'm talking. I'm giving you promises so that my joy might be in you. And if you walk out the door without the joy of the Lord, do you honor God? No. Do you honor God when he says, by my stripes, you are healed and you walk out going, no, I don't need healing. I just want to suffer another three days without that healing. Do you honor him? No. Do you honor him when you walk out the door and say, you know what? I know Jesus paid for my sins and he's forgiven me. But I think I should just carry the guilt of that another couple of days. You honor the King of Kings when you receive what he's done for you. The enemy's trained us to run away from God when we fail, when we sin. Oh, I feel so guilty. I feel this. I feel this. My tank feels empty. So I guess since I'm empty, I'm going to just run away from the gas station. See how the enemy's deceived us? I feel so guilty. You know, I sinned, so I'm going to run away from the Savior. Maybe give it like seven days, kind of like just kind of refresh. Just kind of come back to him after seven days and maybe everything will be cool. No, when we fail, we run. We should run to the King of Kings, right? When you need a tissue, you should just grab one. <laughs> Psalm 1611, you will show me the pathway of life in your presence is fullness of joy. The Bible says at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. You know what we do? We triangulate. Boy, if I could just get the pleasures, then I'd have joy. Right? If I could just get that job, then I'd have joy. If I could get the money, if I could get the girl, then I'd have joy. Right? If I could get that relationship, then I'd have joy. If I could just get out of that relationship, then I'd have joy. If I could have kids, then I'd have joy. No, if I could get rid of my kids, then I'd have joy. We, we triangulate because we don't know what we need in the tank. If we could all get the family and go to Disneyland, then we could have joy. And the truth is people come back from their Disneyland vacation more exhausted and more in need of a vacation than they did when they left. We got to stop not knowing what we need and triangulating and going like, if I could get this, then I'd have this. You know what? In the presence of the Lord, before you go on the vacation this year, get the joy and then you'll know better even where to go and what to do. You'll spend less, less money trying to have joy. You need joy. Getting more money won't give you joy. There's nothing wrong with more money, but get the joy. Then you'll have the energy to produce the more money. Some of you even think if I could just get healed, then I'd have joy. No, no. Get the joy. The joy will work on the inside of you to help you heal. We have to stop triangulating as the family of God. We're pursuing one thing thinking that it will automatically make the other thing. It's a lie. 
You don't need love in the tank. You don't need affirmation. You know, if on Facebook, if I could just get some more likes, if I could get more likes, then I'll have joy. Then I'll be somebody, right? If somebody could just watch my TikTok and then I get all these kind of likes, then I'll have joy. No, no, quit triangulating. Get joy, get joy. Wake up every day and say, this is the day the Lord has made. I'm going to read. You were praying it, right? You're going to read joy. Read joy. How do you read joy? So how do you keep the tank full? You just keep read joy and read joy in the Lord. And again, I say read joy, read joy. Keep getting refilled. The Bible says to be perpetually in a state of getting filled with the Holy Spirit because the Spirit of the Lord is the one that gives us the fruits of the Spirit, which includes Man, you guys are good. Woo! Paul and Silas, they were getting out. They were out preaching and they were doing such a good job. And they didn't even get a chance to take up an offering. And let alone somebody came along and they beat them. They whooped them, threw them down on the street, took them off to prison and threw them in the lowest dungeon, the Bible says. So there's Paul and Silas in the lowest dungeon. And you can imagine what they were doing in the midnight hour. The Bible says they were moaning and groaning and saying, this sucks, man. Why? <laughs> we, you know, well, we were only doing good for people. And how come this is, you know, that's not what they said. The Bible says in the midnight hour, they begin to sing praises and sing hymns. Woo! Now, why do people do like well, that seems crazy, doesn't it? After getting whooped and getting beaten and thrown in jail, why would you begin singing? Because they wanted something. In the presence of the Lord, there is. Their tanks were empty. You know, after you get beaten up by people and by a mob and thrown in prison, your tank tends to be a little bit empty. They knew they needed a fill. So they needed the filling station to show up right there in prison, right there where they were. And so the Bible says they begin to sing and praise the Lord because the Bible says, Psalm 100 says that we enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with joy. So when you begin to praise the Lord, you are in the presence of God. Doesn't matter where you are. You don't need to be here. This is wonderful. But what about your apartment? What about your where you live? I mean, it doesn't matter. You may be living in a halfway house. It doesn't matter. But the Lord. Lord inhabits the praises of his people as you begin to praise the Lord he shows up and in the presence of the Lord there is joy, joy. so you get the joy get it in your tank you get your fill and they begin to pray out of a full place because guess what empty is dangerous when you're empty your flesh takes over and you begin pursuing all kinds of craziness Empty people become alcoholics. Empty people become drug addicts. Empty people steal money. Empty people do anything to fill the empty because we were not designed to be empty. And when empty is in your life, empty talks. Empty talks. Empty is constantly talking. I mean, you don't have to, like if you own a motorbike, if you own a fancy car, and that thing is empty. Let's face it, it talks. Like it, it kind of almost mocks you. I'm sitting on the side of the road and my car was kind of like, you're not so bright, are you? <laughs> like I felt like it was kind of like making fun of me. Here I got my new car and I'm sitting on the side of the road and vroom, vroom. I have to phone a friend and it was an embarrassing phone call. Hey, Jason. Hey, yeah, yeah, I'm having a good day. Um, any chance you're on this side of town with a couple of gallons of gas in the trunk? I, yeah, right. No, I, right. It's, yeah, it's a new car. Oh, it's a great car, right? No. I'm, I'm, no, I ran out of gas. Right. Hey, yeah, I know. That's funny, right? Yeah. Can you just get over here with some gas? Look, it's the whole situation kind of mocks you when you're empty. Right. But you know what? You, you got to stop letting condemnation drive your life. You got to stop letting. The, the naysayer come up and accuse you. You know, the Bible says that the enemy is the accuser of the brethren. Some of you have been letting the accuser drive your life. You've been allowing the accusations like what you didn't do, what you did do, and all the failures and, and how empty your take, tank is. You've been allowing the accuser to drive your life and mock you. He's a mocker. The enemy is an accuser and he's a mocker. And any chance he get, he's going to rub your face in it that your tank is empty. 
But it's not because full tanks aren't because we deserve to have a full tank. Full tanks are because God so loved us that he gave his only begotten son who did the perfect work on the cross that we might have Jesus joy. What did he say? He said, I've spoke these words to you so that my joy might be in you. My joy, my fuel, my strength might be in your life. Just close your eyes for a minute. If that's you, you're saying, Stephen, I've, I've gone long enough with an empty tank. I, I love the Lord. You know, deep down in my heart, I know he loves me. But I'm one of those people I've been driving on empty for too long. Way too long. I want to receive. You said we're in the presence of God right now. I don't want to wait till tomorrow. I don't even want to wait till tonight. I want to receive the joy of the Lord right now. If Jesus paid that for me, I want to receive that. If that's you, just lift your hand and say, enough is enough. Yeah. Just say, look, it's not so much for me to see. It's for God Almighty to see and say, say this, say, enough is enough. I want the joy of the Lord. If that's you, just pray something like this. Just pray this. Dear Lord Jesus. You are the source of life. You came to give me life abundantly. I want it. I hear the word of God that I need joy. I've been joyless way too long. Say that. I've been joyless way too long. Now in your name, Jesus. I receive joy. That's it. Just expect the Lord to fill you. Say this, Holy Spirit. Flood my heart. Bring the joy of Jesus. Fill my life. Activate me. But I need your power. as you go forward into this day, into this week, I want you to expect to live like you've never lived, to walk like you've never walked. And, and it's not based on what you do, it's based on what He does, what He does in you. Expect more. You honor God when you expect from heaven, when you expect God to supply. The word says to trust in the Lord with what of your heart? All of your heart. So why do you keep trusting in yourself? Why do you keep trusting in what you can do? Why do you keep trusting in how strong you are? Doesn't your next heartbeat ultimately come from God Almighty? You can't make your heart beat. You can't consciously make that organ in your chest move, pump. So if you can't control your own heartbeat, if you can't ordain the next heartbeat, why do you trust so much in what you do and in your own personal strength? Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. 